And with no further ado, I'd like to introduce our panel. So if you would like to learn anything more about today's speakers, we will include a link in the chat with their full bios. Um, but first we have Gabe Lindo. Gabe is the Director of Content Programming for TikTok Canada. Gabe's experience is as a lawyer, executive, and board director working on projects across film, television, digital content, gaming, festivals, and live theater. Previously leading CBC's digital content offerings, he is currently leading the content strategy for TikTok in Canada as Director of Content Programming. Next, we have Lena Minifee, who is the CEO of Stories First and co-founder of SAAS platform Cool World. Lena is an impact media, film, and television producer and digital strategist whose recent projects include the series and interactive digital timeline, British Columbia and Untold History, interactive audiovisual web art, Sense of Home, and impact in marketing campaigns for Indian Horse, The Grizzlies, Monkey Beach, and the new corporation, an unfortunately unnecessary, uh, sorry, an unfortunately necessary sequel. Next, we have Michelle Pratt. Michelle is the president of Boat Rocker Media and general manager of Boat Rocker Studios, where he spearheaded the expansion into original digital content and led the acquisitions of Jamfield, Matador Content, Untitled Entertainment, Platform One, and various venture investments. He currently oversees the day-to-day -day operating divisions of television, kids and family, and representation, in addition to the studio. And next we have Rignam Wong Kong. Rignam is an award-winning multimedia producer with the CBC, currently at the CBC Creator Network, which seeks to discover and develop the work of digital content creators across Canada. He has produced documentaries, essays, and reported for the CBC from Yellowknife, Winnipeg, and Toronto, and recently served as chair Diversify CBC, an employee resource group that represents over 350 people of color to advocate for inclusion at the CBC. And I will pass it off to our moderator for this session, Anita Lee. Uh, Anita is a media strategist and consultant with a decade of experience as a multi-platform journalist at outlets across North America. She is a journalism instructor, the co-founder of Canadian Journalists of Color, a rapidly growing network of racialized media makers in Canada, as well as member of the 2020-2021 Online News Association Board of Directors and founder of The Other Wave, her newsletter about challenging the status quo in journalism. Thank you so much, everyone, and welcome. We're very excited for this. Thanks so much, Katie. Um, hey, everybody. As Katie mentioned, my name is Anita Lee. I'm a longtime journalist and news entrepreneur, as well as founder and editor-in-chief of The Other Wave. Welcome to the future of entertainment, creating content that resonates, our very first members lounge session, which is very exciting. I'm thrilled to welcome up our panelists, Gabe, Lena, Michelle, and Rignam. So let's kick things off. Um, so we've heard your bios, but I'd love to hear more about what you specifically do in your current role. So what's your day to day like? Please describe that. And you know what, let's start with Michelle. Thanks, Anita. Uh, and hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, so as my bio summarized, I, I oversee the effectively the, the core operating parts of our business. Um, that includes a variety of different production companies, our brands and distribution team, uh, our large animation studios, um, as well as uh, our talent representation and, and management business, uh, Untitled Entertainment. And really what it, what it means is a lot of uh, amazing creators, producers, uh, as well as, as our back office supports the creation of content. And my job is to make sure they have the resources that they need in the first instance, particularly in a world where everything's changing so much. The buyers are changing. Obviously, COVID was a huge challenge for everyone. Uh, so that's kind of the first part. So that day-to-day -day means week-to-week -week checking in with um, with our producers, with our, our business leads to make sure uh, that productions are on track, that the development process is going the way it is, and then connect the dots to any capital as we invest in our own series as well that they need. And then secondly, working with our corporate development team uh, and, our, and our board to make sure that we are kind of figuring out where things are going next. And so trying to take all the information that I can with my team and say, hey, you know, th there's a real trend, for example, around documentaries right now, something we've been passionate about, I've been passionate about personally, uh, but increasingly the ability to produce through COVID, for example, allowed us to complete those more easily than a live scripted or unscripted series. And so making sure that we're then, you know, either looking at investments, acquisitions, or, or frankly, just guiding our teams to the right buyers in that time period. So it involves a lot of meetings, um, a lot of late night or weekend reading to catch up on actual work as I'm sure everybody's had, particularly during the pandemic. Um, and then, you know, having the opportunity to work with a, a very broad range of creators, both geographically and, as well as, as by background and, and various bu uh, budget levels uh, and genres. Um, quite importantly, as one final thought, we work across 
scripted, unscripted kids and family and do everything from, you know, YouTube or Snapchat originals to some of the highest uh, budget series, um, which makes for a very complex day. Some days I wish we, you know, did one thing and only one thing, but you know, given the, the volatility in the business, we like the idea of being diversified. So that's, that's most of my day uh, and it's never the same. Okay, thanks, that's great. Um, Lena, you're up, you're up next. Yes, hi, thanks Anita, thanks Michelle. Um, so just wanna acknowledge that I'm coming to you from Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh and Squamish territories here in Vancouver. Um, I, my day-to-day -day is, is a little bit like Michelle's. I think all of us uh, have wear a lot more hats during this sort of digital, forced digital, um, transition in Canada that we've a little, been a little bit late to. <laughs> so uh, I worked in the US a lot and I still work uh, sometimes getting our stories across borders. So I work as mostly primarily as a digital strategist as well. I produce um, uh, content, indigenous and BIPOC content. Um, I work a little bit uh, on both scripted and unscripted for promoting, promoting and marketing. So stories versus more of our fees for service. Um, company that I'm the CEO of uh, as well and, and sort of making people helping them with their digital planning their digital um, content and also their community outreach and reaching what we call niche audiences to this day um, and then with Coral our SaaS platform <coughs> we, have, we have five people who are uh, involved that we're all co-founders of this and we're sort of getting this platform up and running so we're basically developing going from alpha to beta getting that out so people filmmakers, producers, distributors can reach their own audiences and take them off of the social media platform giants. So uh, okay. lots of meetings <laughs> and developing so. Okay, fantastic. Um, we'll move on to Dave next. Hi everyone. Um, so my, my team is really focused on the sort of overall in-app experience for TikTok as well as the content ecosystem in Canada. Um, and so there's really like four functions just to might be helpful to sort of understand. So the first would be looking at editorial for TikTok. So that would be primarily the discover page, which sort of sets the tone for um, what's happening in a week, um, what the sort of priorities or the themes that are resonant uh, or relevant in that particular uh, time frame. Um, and then the other piece is around in content insights, looking at um, what are some of the verticals that are burgeoning that uh, we see opportunity in that uh, are growing and there's a growing interest in. Um, the third piece is around creative effects. Um, and what that essentially means is, uh, you know, TikTok's um, ability to create tools that allow creators to um, create content and remove barriers to creation. So giving people, um, you know, studio level software tools for for content creation, whether it be AR based or sound effects or creative effects. Um, so we develop and pitch and, and um, innovate on ideas that can be used by creators to, to contain to tell new stories. And so that's a big part of my team's function. Uh, and then lastly, um, we're leading really heavily into live streaming, live programming. And so um, we uh, one of the functions that we do is we look at um, working to program uh, live experiences, live streams with the like, creators as well as with media publishers, broadcasters, and other partners. So that's a bit of an overview. Okay, fantastic. And then last but not least, Frignam. So uh, as a producer with the Creator Network, uh, generally, you know, what we do is discover and develop emerging content creators and independent filmmakers from across Canada. Um, the Creator Network is pretty relatively new arm of CBC compared to other verticals at CBC. And uh, we have producers in Toronto, Winnipeg, Halifax, and Vancouver, and we're uh, expanding to other regions um, this year. Um, and we're always, you know, scouting out emerging talent, whether it's digitally or in person at events or, um, you know, just do references as well. Um, so the first arm of what we do is, is talent scouting, and then we develop the talent in terms of being able to create uh, videos with them, short form digital series, uh, mainly YouTube is our platform. And so uh, my day to day would be to, you know, solicit pitches, go through pitches and evaluate them, um, green light them and then work towards uh, development. So there's a little bit of pre development. Um, there's a development relationship in terms of um, 
you know, how we commission things according to what we, uh, our editorial lanes are, and then being able to produce. So it's a, a really um, collaborative process with us and the creators um, where we, I would provide notes on, on their scripts and then, uh, and then kind of work on rough cuts and then uh, get them to be published. And um, so on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, you know, I'll have conversations with, you know, our team, with the creators, um, and no, just like Michelle and others, I think no, no one day is the same and, and it's kind of changed during the pandemic. Um, back in the day, we used to meet face-to-face -face with creators. Um, now it's all over Zoom. And um, I would say that, uh, you know, we manage a roster of, you know, close to probably 30 or 40 creators. And then we're in contact with hundred or more at one time, not all of me, obviously, but, um, we try to cast a pretty wide net. Okay. Well, that all sounds really exciting. It sounds like in your leadership roles, you have to scout content creators and monitor content trends pretty consistently. So to set the stage for the meat of our conversation, I'd love if each of you could briefly share the kinds of digital content that resonates with you across the genres and platforms, and then just answer and tell me what do you like to consume and what really stands out to you personally? And anybody can feel free to jump in. All right, I'm going to go first. Um, I think for me, it, it, like uh, listen, every every piece of content, effectively, other than maybe live events, can be digital, and those have been out of our lives for a year. So we we really try to focus or think about story. And frankly, personally, I think what digital means to me is if I want to go deep on something, I can. And so you know, you watch you know Queen's Gambit, uh, and then you say, hey, I need to play digital chess and I need to read about it. And then all of a sudden you're buying chess sets for people. And it's like, you know, we I think we'll talk a bit later, Anita, about um, the power of or sort of the, the focus on data analytics and understanding audience. And really, we're, we're increasingly focused, given our experience on understanding the talent, largely the people that are on camera, but oftentimes off camera as well, if they have followings, what's their voice, who do they speak to? And in success, what is IP going to meet from an audience perspective? And I track that as I'm sure you guys do in your own behaviors. When when something resonates with you, if you watch Narcos, um, our, the, the vice chair of our studio, Katie O'Connell was the, the head of Goldman, executive producer of that show. And you know, we often talk about how do you back up a scripted drama like that with the documentaries and the Time Magazine stories, et cetera, with that fodder for content to really capture that cultural moment. Because I think what did digital is done has made it harder to break through. But once you do, you know, you can, you can be all consuming. So when I think about digital, I really do think of it that way. That's great. I can go next uh, in terms of what I'm watching. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm enjoying this transition because I'm a new father. So, you know, I'm now starting to get a lot of parenting content and I'm realizing there's a whole new side of YouTube. So <laughs> um, I, I think that's where I kind of learned about the specificity and nicheness of, of content, right? I mean, before when I wasn't a parent, it was all, you know, mostly MBA and, and things that I'm really interested in. And now I'm, since I'm trying to raise a baby, I'm just getting parenting videos thrown at me all the time. Um, so you know, educational content is something that, you know, we try to kind of work towards and also what I'm interested in, in terms of how to's, um, explainers, um, you know, CBC does a lot of daily news podcasts. Um, uh, and, and just in terms of my own personal uh, content uh, watching, um, I'd say UGC and, and a lot of meme accounts are really big. I mean, I think we all love memes. Um, relaxation and travel content uh we can't go anywhere so it's really nice to just sit back and kind of imagine a, a different world um and then um in terms of platforms i mean for me i'm a big music fan so uh spotify is always on for me and uh and it's really good background for work congrats on becoming a dad by the way that's awesome um, and I just want to say that's I did um, I did some uh, I did a study or uh, some research for an article for the Canada Media Fund and a lot of what you said resonates around uh, content that is more you know it's funnier it's more about relaxation during such a kind of a tense time uh, during the pandemic it seems to be that a lot of audiences are gravitating towards that so Lena Gabe do you have any comments on this question yeah. <laughs> Uh, thanks again for bringing up comedy. I definitely am uh, taking in a lot more lighter fare comedy, dramedy, um, queer comedy, like it's a sin. Uh, 
the BIPOC comedy, anything from Array, of course. And I, I, I really am digging the darker stuff. If I can have time, I'm going to dig into that too. But I do like the historical um, content that's coming out now, and it's kind of had a more powerful voice than ever. So like Raoul Peck's and Exterminate All Brutes, um, learning about the colonization um, and history is really important for me because it's kind of the content I work on as well. And Indigenous film, I'm always watching indigenous features uh, as much as I can, possibly can. And of course, the um, some of the sitcoms that are coming out right now. So. Yeah, just really quickly for me. I mean, I, I love um, certainly long form programming. So I'm sure a lot of the things that people have been watching. Um, for me on TikTok, it's been I love just being able to be exposed to different things, um, particularly around like the learn on TikTok content. So I get a lot of um, like different hacks and, and DIY hacks um, that are really cool. Um, but then also like golf tutorials and you know cooking, like there's just a, sort of a random array of stuff that's great. Um, and then uh, and like anything stand-up oriented is, is also awesome right now. Great. Yeah. One of the reasons why I really wanted to ask that question was just to really illustrate, you know, the, the breadth and, and diversity and depth of content um, that resonates with so many different types of audiences. And we kind of touched on the idea of an audience or what audience is. And I want to dive deeper into that. So in recent years, we've seen more and more Canadian content creators serving niche target audiences. And no longer are they trying to capture a singular homogenous audience. So what kind of opportunities has this new approach opened up for you guys? in this space? I would kind of like to dig into it first, if I can. Um, I, it's kind of something I've been saying for a really long time, like 80% of the world is, is non-white. So <laughs> these niche audiences are actually kind of mainstream audiences in some places. So Canada has a huge opportunity to kind of be representing um, diverse and pluralistic voices across and sort of getting that content out beyond our, our national walls or whatever you want to call them borders um but i've been saying it for a, a ton of time and now it seems like everyone knows we're well beyond the 500 uh, channel in this world so you know three percent of canada's is quite diverse um and so what we call niche audiences tend to being these audiences but they're mostly bipoc lgbtq people who've been marginalized or racialized in some way but it's way more fascinating to to to, to be able to dig into these people's authentic worlds. And so um, I'm kind of really excited about the opportunities that are coming up where you can reach your own audience. You can you know what your psychodemographic is, you can go towards them, you can target, you understand how they work and operate and where they're going to watch this stuff. And we have to know more, like our filmmakers have to know their audiences way better than distributors and platforms now, so. Anyone wanna chime into that? Yeah, I mean, I think again, from from where from what I see coming through uh, on the more long form television side, maybe kind of two areas about niche audiences. You know, anything that's been innovative. I use Narcos as an example, but there's so many. We had Orphan Black, which had a you know female lead playing nine or eleven characters. I'm gonna forget all sorts of different you know uh, uh, backgrounds in her character. There was never going to be a broadcast executive that was going to say. I, I really want to buy again Narcos subtitles and English and Spanish. And by the way, that's going to become a global hit. And so I think the way we think about you know niche audiences again is, is like what's authentic, what's a story that someone's passionate about, and do they have the capabilities, the talent, and then the backing with us and whatever broadcast or other partners we can bring to the table to make it as true as it is. And there's so much truth in every story. I mean, you go back to uh, the earliest playwrights, you know, who are working on a project about Shakespeare with a very different non-gendered lens right now or, or something else like that. And you're like, th there's so much truth to when, when someone spoke to their era, spoke to their community, it actually resonated through the rest of humanity. And I know that sounds quite lofty, but, but I think that's the trend that we've seen in the content that has not broken through, not, not, not always, but oftentimes is a current of it was derivative. And it got ordered by, you know, partners that rightfully so were like, hey, this is working. Let's see if we can go deeper. And I think there's a bit of that. Like you'll do one, two, three, four, five series like that as a buyer and as a studio. And then at some point people are like, I've, I've seen that already. Let's go on to the next thing, particularly in scripted content. So that's sort of part one of it. And, and then part two, again, just goes back to what I was saying earlier, Nita, about 
really understanding or using our partners for there. We don't have gave what you have and, and what other platforms have to really understand analytics. We can pay a lot of money for software and, and things like that. But when we're working with a writing partner, when we're working with on-screen talent, they know their audiences more than ever. This is example of, you know, Johnny Carson didn't have a relationship with his audience, even though he had probably a bigger audience than Jimmy Fallon does, but Jimmy Fallon can probably figure out who his audience is because he talks to them, he hears from them and, and that's a new trend. And so we really try to rely on that person, take the time to understand them and then craft IP or series around that. Yeah, we'll definitely dig into the idea of what authenticity is um, in a later question. Um, Dave or Rignum, any thoughts? Yeah, I would just say like, I think that what's exciting right now is um, when you think about this the question like niche audiences, I think that um, what we're starting to see broadly is that there are voices that um, traditionally haven't had the amplification um, that they may have deserved that are reaching broad audiences, right? And so I think that's really powerful, whether it's like I May Destroy You or other um, series that you would think are niche, they're actually resonating and reaching larger audiences. Um, and that's is exactly what we're sort of seeing on TikTok. So um, what's exciting is that, you know, you can have someone, you can have a creator who um, you may think of as niche and maybe they're from a um, underrepresented voice, but they're actually reaching broadly outside of their community to, and, and beyond Canada as well. Like a lot of the engagement that creators are seeing that are Canadian um, is outside of Canada. So I think that's also broadening what it means to be niche. Like, I think broadening the array of people who have access to be able to tell stories is, is uh, a huge win, not just for the creators, but I think ultimately for audiences who are going to be able to get a broader variety of stories that are going to resonate with them. So um, I think that's a, a really um, noticeable shift that's happening right now. That's fascinating. That actually raises a, the, the notion or challenges the notion of what CanCon or Canadian content is, especially if Canadian content creators are resonating with so many uh, audiences outside the country. So we'll definitely look into that in a sec. Uh, Rignam? Yeah, I mean, building on to what Gabe said, I think it really uh, brings up a good point in terms of, um, you know, who's, who's watching these stories. Um, you know, when we talk about a niche audience or even a, a community story, um, if I use even a specific community, like say the Laos, Laos, the Laos community, if you make, if there's a story told about the Laos community, that doesn't mean that it, it's only going to be the Laos community that's going to be watching that. Um, you know, that content can resonate to, to anybody, um, especially if it's a good story. It's, it's a good story is a good story. Um, you know, I think for me, an example for me is, you know, uh, as, as a non-white male, I mean, I, I watched The Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, who's, which is about, you know, a white male. That doesn't mean it's, you know, I can, I, it's made for somebody else, but I can still enjoy that piece of, you know, storytelling. Um, and so I think when we think about content in that way, it really opens up what we can do and what is considered niche and what isn't and who these stories are for. Um, and then in terms of just niche content from a, from a digital perspective, um, you know, CBC does digital. Um, and because we do digital, we're able to target specific audiences um, because it's not made for broadcast. If we're, if we're doing something broadcast, it's gonna have to be more, um, you know, widespread appeal. Um, it's just the nature of broadcast TV, but because we have so many digital platforms, we're able to target those audiences. So uh, it makes it easier. Yeah, I love what you and Lena brought up about this notion of um, the idea of niche being challenged. And in fact, a lot of these audiences that are considered niche in like a North American context are actually quite mainstream elsewhere. And I find that like, obviously fascinating and particularly relevant to Canada, given that we have so many um, diasporas and we're a country, like a young country of many like of, of immigrants really. So Lena, I actually wanna ask you a follow-up question about that. Um, you mentioned that impactful equity focused and mission driven content is more in demand uh, as a result of serving multiple audiences. So can you elaborate a bit on that and then why you and your team at Stories First are prioritizing this kind of content and the opportunities you see there? Yeah, uh, thank you. And I'm, I'm just gonna probably repeat a lot what Gavin Ringham has to say, but um, 
there is a desire for for authentic voices and there's a desire for people to be specific about their stories and how they resonate to other humans is is how you be specific and true to to those that storytelling we really wanted to focus uh, focus on racialized indigenous lgbtq um and social issue stories because we frankly there's so much there is so much data and content information and sort of the last um I don't know, the last decade of people moving over to sort of Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, uh, which I go on holes uh, down TikTok holes all the time. Uh, there's so many voices that are um, have not been heard before and have not been able to tell their stories, and they're quite frankly fascinating in the new era of storytelling and really breaking boundaries with the way they tell stories. So we focus on it because I've always focused on it. It's a little bit hard to answer. Like I've always, uh, since I started in film, was doing indigenous film and always crewing to like 85% indigenous or BIPOC crew. I, it's just something I've been passionate about until this time. But a lot, if you take a Venn diagram to cover kind of social issues, as well as uh, queer and, and BIPOC, these things intersect often. And not only do they inter intersect often, we're kind of being punished for it um, through these mainstream social media, especially in the last year. And if you guys noticed during the US election, all my clients and starting to talk to people to say, if we bring up a word like education or indigenous or black, it sometimes often gets flagged now as political content, even when it's not like these these words just based on US algorithms and their rules for um, what happened during their political campaigning. So it's getting harder and harder to sort of identify ourselves and, and find each other online. So that's really why it's more important to dig into that because when all of it was open when the pipeline for Twitter and Facebook and there's no algorithm crush on it. We are reaching each other all the time across geographies, territories, countries uh, to connect and tell each other stories. So um, that work is just needs to keep going. That's fascinating. And I, I definitely wanna to, uh, touch on that a bit more in terms of surfacing these kind of content creators. Um, but I wanna go back to something that all of you actually mentioned in your previous answers. And it's this idea of authenticity. So authenticity has almost become a buzzword um, in the content creation world, but industry leaders, including you guys here, said authenticity is essential for content to resonate with audiences. So I wanna ask you why that is the case and also what do you really mean by authentic voice? I'll go if no, if no one else is interested. I mean, I, I think that um, for me, I think authenticity just means that uh, there's an ability for the story to connect with others, right? Like it's there's resonance in um, the truth of what that authentic story is. And I think that all great comedians, all great stories ultimately um, are able to travel if they're told right, if they're told from a, a place that has truth and meaning, it can resonate beyond the scope of the audience that it's intended for. It, it's universal. And, you know, I think for me, like one of the, the big reasons I was interested in, in coming to TikTok is that this idea of authenticity, um, I think historically has been lacking in social media. Um, and, you know, I think with TikTok, this idea of the last sunny place on the internet or this mission to bring joy and this mission to sort of amplify voices and to be very creator centric um, is something that is personally resonant to me because I think that, um, you know, how a platform can um, surface and help to tell stories and to connect to people is ultimately what it means to be human, right? In terms of our ability to, to share stories. Um, in this one stat that I just recently read about TikTok is that in Canada, um, I think it's 88% of people who use TikTok feel happy after they've used it. And I feel like that's such a powerful sentiment, right? That it makes you feel good, like that there are people there who are um, sharing who they are authentically across the board in, in whatever area um, of interest they're in. So I think that like just the community and ecosystem that we're trying to cultivate is one where um, people whose voices, it's not about, oh, do this and you'll be successful, do this and you'll be viral. It's rather like, who are you? And just show up in that space in that way 
and connect to like-minded people and connect to others who who want to hear your story. So um, yeah, I think like, I'm, I'm sure we all, everyone on this panel is, is like very passionate about this idea of authentic storytelling, because ultimately, like, if it's not authentic, then like, it's not going to land, it's not going to resonate. So great content is by definition authentic. That's a fantastic answer. Anybody else? Yeah, I mean, I would just add on to that and saying that it's just being yourself and, and, um, being proud to to kind of put that wear that on your chest and and wear that and put that into your content and into your storytelling, um, you know uh, there has to be the element of truth and and you know and it, it needs to reflect you know if it is if it is the community you're from or it'll reflect the community you're from, um, and not try to cater to a trend or a uh, um, a type of storytelling just because that's in uh, in trending right now. Um, but really staying true to who you are and, and, um, and yeah, I mean, not, it's tough when you're pitching to broadcasters. I, I understand that because there are a lot of hands in the pie, but, um, you know, understanding that you have a vision and, and you want to stick to that vision. Okay. Michelle, Lena, did you have anything to add? If not, we can move on because there are definitely a few other questions that I want to dive into for the audience. I, yeah, I just wanted to basically say what they said except for there's a vulnerability to it and a rawness and a realness and I think people are pressed to try to fake that sometimes in order to get specific um, through media but your your audience can tell they can tell if it's not not true so uh, the compelling stories have that authenticity for sure that's a good reminder okay great uh, so this actually touches on something you mentioned earlier Lena about finding you know communities finding each other um, but it is a question that's directed towards Gabe. So social platforms have helped democratize content by making it easier for creators to develop a loyal following and fan base without having to rely on a traditional marketing infrastructure, for example. So Gabe, you told me in an earlier conversation that platforms like TikTok can be used for talent development, um, particularly for creators who don't have easy access to these kind of formalized traditional networks. So can you tell me how that works? Yeah, for sure. I, mean, I think that, you know, I, coming from a broadcaster, I think that the, the challenge is when you're a broadcaster, you have a limited amount of time in your, your day part to, to tell stories, right? There's, you know, time is fixed. Um, what, when it's looking at digital, like there's obviously um, the barriers, you don't have that same time constraint, that same schedule reliance. And so you're able to experiment more. And I think uh, that's the freedom that, you know, Ringham has on, on the digital side at CBC, for example. Um, you know, what I was talking about with talent development, I think is just that, you know, ultimately when you have a large funnel, um, the more people who have access to tools to create, the more people who, are able to tell stories um, and to allow those stories to be unfiltered and to reach um, audiences, the more opportunity there is to discover people with incredible talent and incredible stories to share. And I think that's the thing that excites me literally every week on TikTok where, you know, we're looking at um, creators who are trending or new creators who literally over a short period of time have really managed to, to, um, to connect with, with audiences and with people, with the, the ways that they're sharing their, their, their content and their narratives. And I, you know, I think like the, you know, to the extent there are producers on this call, I think that um, it's really a, a rich environment to sort of explore and to see like who are the people who are really resonating and creating content that's interesting? Um, because those are often people who, you know, haven't gone to film school. They haven't, you know, gone to CFC or haven't been a part of sort of traditional long form storytelling, but they have so much great talent and, and ability to connect with audiences. So um, what are ways that producers can work with um, TikTok creators who have these authentic um, places that they're coming from to tell stories and are, are clearly engaging audiences, both in Canada and internationally, 
And how can you actually create and develop IP in a way that's going to take the best of what they bring and then pair it with um, someone that's more on the long form storytelling side. And so I think that, um, and I think that's across the board from whether it's narrative, whether it's sketch and comedy, whether it might be, you know, home and garden or design and renovations, like there's just people with, that have, have clearly have incredible talent and incredible ways of engaging with audiences that, um, you know, I'm just surprised that more people aren't leveraging and taking advantage of, of all that is to offer. So I think that that's one of the, the spaces that, that I'm excited about and um, encourage others to, to explore, which is how do you leverage um, the, the way that TikTok is able to surface creators and talent? And how do you leverage that to um, work with those folks um, in developing their IP and then working with them on, on other projects. Great. Does anybody have anything to add to that about, you know, talent scouting? Yeah, I just, I, I'd say like, aside from annoying, you know, the majority of our team, if I see something on Instagram or in a news story and flip it somewhere and it's like, hey, this is cool, where normally I would have had to take the time to cut it out of an article or to like send something. I think it, it gave you 100% right. The, the, discovery of talent is really core to this. We have had a lot of attempts and not a lot of successful ones to, to, to translate a digital series to television or even vice versa. Like we've had a bit of more success in taking known IP like from Black and doing a, an audio podcast, but the discovery of people and then working with them to understand the medium that you're trying to translate them to. Um, if you're deep in you know documentaries or television or film or, or digital, whatever it is, you can find, you can see someone and say, hey, for me, that person will work. There will be value in us working together. Um, and so I think that's a great way to frame it um, is, is that is that discovery piece. Uh, but also we all have limited time in a day. And so if you're a long form, you know, a storyteller in the scripted space, whether it's film or, or television, say, trying to do a web series can be very difficult. It's a different medium. It's a different beats. It's a, you know, different story arc. And so really sticking to what you're good at, finding that breakthrough and then and, and experimenting, but figuring out what you feel comfortable with, I think is probably a good starting point. I just saw in the chat, somebody asking kind of where to start. And I think that resonates with me more than anything. It's just making sure that you don't get too blinded by the, the, the number of different options that are out there. Um, just because it's video doesn't mean it fits your self skill sets. As I say, we've had very limited success, even though we've optioned or partnered with a lot of digital first creators um, until we learn that not everybody that has a big following should necessarily be in a scripted drama. It doesn't mean there's not a lot of ways for work for them or, or for them to find other partners, but certainly for us. Um, and I think that's a, a good starting point to just manage your time, manage how many different mediums you're working in and get one right before you try to go more broadly. Yeah. Can I just add, Anita? Yeah. Um, so you know, for CBC, uh, traditionally, it's been a big fortress from the outside, um, you know, whether you're a journalist or you're a creator or a filmmaker, um, it can feel very, uh, very difficult to get in or, or to understand how to even pitch or where to pitch. So we're trying to bring those barriers down by, you know, by doing the outreach and by providing the platforms to, to have multiple points of entry into the CBC. Um, you know, starting with short form, which is creator network, you can, you can move up to, to web series to then hopefully TV. And then you also have radio and podcasts, um, uh, available as well to pitch to, um, you know, one example is, um, is the creator Yute Lee, who's, uh, who's got a YouTube called about here, which does urban planning videos around, uh, how to reimagine your city. Um, you know, I discovered him on Reddit. Uh, I saw he had you know, two or three videos on YouTube, reached out to him and, and introduced him to our uh, Vancouver producer who uh, then commissioned him uh, for uh, one video and then multiple series after that. Since then, it's been about two years. Uh, he's worked on close to two, over 10 videos for CBC. He just got, you know, signed for another 10 this year. Um, and he's, you know, doing even longer form. Uh, he's moving, he's, we helped him start his production company. Um, and now he is doing longer form web series. And so uh, we're hope that's the kind of ladder that we hope and pipeline to develop that we're trying to do um, because 
um, it just makes it easier as, as, as they enter the CBC ecosystem to kind of move through afterwards. Okay, thanks so much, Rignam, for that. Um, I, my last question was about where the money for and funding for Canadian content creators are, but I can see from the Q&A that there's a ton of questions for you guys. So I'd love for you guys to somehow weave money or funding into the, your answers at some point, because I'm sure that's something that is a pressing kind of uh, topic for our audience today. But what I want to do is kick things off with a question from Robert Skeynes. So Robert says, as an independent producer, and because analy analytics is such a core component of pitching and valuable to know on its face, I would love to get some sense of the value and format the possible partners, whether that's financing, production, or distribution, need to see as part of the project. And it's a feature film in, in Robert's case. Are there specific locations and or metrics to research? And that's the question. I think research and metrics are what you have access to. I, I, if you do work with a digital agency or, you work, or you're working with somebody, um, if you're working, uh, if you get a distributor, they'll have analytics for theatrical. Um, mostly, I kind of pr propose to people that they start to build their own social media content and go towards their own website in order to keep those analytics. So you can, you're an owner of basically all of your Google analytics as well as all your social. So you can kind of take that information and uh, use it to further, but that should really start. Um, and when you start development, you should kind of be start starting to think of marketing and building your audience and figuring out who they are and really keying into the psycho demographics. So there's a couple of questions I get people to feed themselves to ask who they are in order to figure out maybe where their, where their audience is um, and, where, and what to dig into. And then it's testing and then reiterating that all the way through your entire, when it comes to production and you're putting out posts will attract certain people. And then when it comes to actual releasing, it may be a different group that you didn't think about. So it's always sort of looking, keeping your own data, retesting or working with somebody who knows how to do this. So. That's great advice. Anybody else? If not, we can move in on to the next question from Leah Rifkin. So Leah says, it's a question for everybody. Do you find that though many creators uh, cater to niche audiences and broadcast broadcasters say they want niche stories, are there still barriers when it comes to the numbers? Um, I find it can sometimes feel like a bit of a catch 22. Ringham probably has something to say about this, but there that's why uh, people are starting to dig into this more. So um, REMC, um, uh, Rachel Equity and Media Co Collective, <laughs> they're starting to dig in more and sort of ask Canada, can you please take these numbers because they haven't been doing it for television and they haven't been doing it. And, um, and distributors are just sort of like tuning in right now, but the USA has been doing this for like 10 years and their streamers are totally ahead. And that's how they actually target everything you guys are watching on streamers. They have all that data. And this is why they, they may know our, our own audiences in Canada now better than us, because we just haven't been looking at this. So there's a lot of people really pushing hard uh, to get Canada up to speed. And, and this interruption during COVID hopefully is the right kick in the butt to start doing this work, so. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Anyone else? If not, let's move on to a question for Gabe about TikTok. So Phil Kluba says, I'd love to hear more details about what TikTok has planned for live programming. Will live shopping be a tool? Will allowing for brands to sell their product live through fun and engaging live streams be a possibility? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's um, the, the, uh, the product will evolve over time. Um, I always try to say that, you know, live is, something that's only uh, it's only launched uh, I think early into the pandemic last year and so uh, new things will be coming um, what I would say that is interactivity is something that we think a lot about um, and so as we look at lives um, the ways that we can engage uh, folks so it's not just a passive experience but it's something that is uh, more active and interactive um, again, thinking about what does live mean in the context of TikTok, which is about community, which is about um, creators. So I think you'll start to see um, initiatives that incorporate those principles of interactivity and community within the live experience itself. 
Okay, great. And this is a question from a couple of people. So Wasifa and Devki asked about advice that all of you guys could give to, to young digital creators just starting off. Um, Devki actually specifically asked, uh, how, do you, how do they make sure that their work stands out when they're trying to break into the industry? I can start. Um, I would say develop develop an expertise. Um, f find a way for you to be, uh, whether it's an expert or, or really champion a certain perspective or a certain uh, community or a certain area of uh, subject area. Um, you know, we really like looking for subject matter experts or people um, who have a background in a certain thing that they can leverage in their storytelling or in their content. Um, and then kind of, you know, really do the work to, to create um, and, and build your audience and, and continue to connect with them. Um, you know, it's not easy work. You know, I understand it may seem, it may sound really rosy, but it's really tough. And I, you know, firsthand I've heard the experiences of, of you know, the countless hours you have to put in to create um, and to kind of constantly be on. Um, but, you know, that's the lifestyle that, uh, you know, comes with, you know, being a, kind of a creative and in, in, in the industry. Uh, for the most part, but um, you know, going back to the other question about niche and 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 widespread, um, you know, when it comes to broadcast or wider TV, there is there is that need for that widespread, just that's the nature of the beast. But you know, with the Creator Network, we're looking for niche. Um, you know, we don't we're, doesn't matter how niche because uh, we you know we just recently did a series on uh, cosplay, which is. Um, you know, it's niche, but it's actually big. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a way that niche can get big. And, and you, got, you can look at gaming, for example, esports. If you talk to somebody about esports 10, 15 years ago, they would have looked at you like you're crazy. And now it's a billion dollar industry and growing. Um, so it's really, uh, and, and when you talk about digital, we're allowed to go into that niche. Um, so it, it is difficult, and I know that it can seem from the outside that you're you're it, you don't know where to where to pitch or how to format, but um, there there is a formula. Okay. Anyone else want to add to what Rignam said? Oh, yeah, Michelle. Oh, 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 Michelle. No, I was gonna say uh, I'm good. Okay, Lena, go for it. There's always these two roads, right? The parallel is always sort of like you're doing the mainstream while you're doing the, the niche audience because good stories are good stories. And as you guys, you know, we all said, people want to partake and listen and learn and um, be emerged in it regardless. Um, I wanted to just say that if, if anybody else has questions, I don't know, Anita, if you're allowed to put up my um, email, that's totally fine for people to contact me because um, I'll be doing some future webinars about the rise of BIPOC data and distribution. But uh, it's, I think that it, you always have to kind of play both and, and always think about the center and then the specifics. It's, it's kind of the, the best marketing, so. Yeah, and absolutely. I'm sure we can get the Academy team to share your contact information. So thanks for um, being so generous. I'm gonna end the Q&A with a question uh, that I asked a bit earlier and that one of our audience members has asked um, that's around funding. So specifically Albert uh, Zafari is asking, what's the best way to fund a short film of a young black Canadian story? And is there any kind of market for this kind of content in Canada? Um, so I'd love for one of you or a few of you guys to answer Albert's question, but also just talk more broadly about where funding is, um, like where the money is and what, what funders want. Michelle and Ringham have all the money. Go to them. Um, I, I'll, I'm, I uh, well started uh, my days at, at uh, what was Temple Street at the time, which gave, I think we worked on some stuff or you did with some of our colleagues too back then, the CBC. Um, I don't spend as much time in the funding model as we used to. We used to have an initiative um, which uh, uh, has not continued after three or four years, but was a great project uh, with the remix project called the city life film project that was short sp film specific is something gave maybe we can revisit together um <laughs> if you guys have a platform but really it was focused on at the time i guess referred to as underserved communities in toronto working with the both the toronto police force or at least a swap policeman who wanted to do this in remix 
to make short films and fund them. Um, that's no longer uh, operating now. The remix does a lot of work and is always a good home. So I can't speak specifically to the grants and the CMF, uh, you know, uh, to Bell Fund, a few others on the phone. I know those are resources. I do think that uh, more broadly on funding, there's a lot of capital going into content right now, uh, you know, whether it's from government agencies, grants, uh, but, but certainly from brands. Um, I think being reliant on a studio like ours to fund films is probably a challenge. There's not a lot of clear paths to that uh, for us from a business model perspective. But I think, it, uh, you know, trying to find uh, the, the voice that you're trying to do and trying to determine a style pretty inexpensively with a phone, with, you know, a small project and really define what the story you're trying to tell, there should be enough, uh, no, it should be enough. There's certainly not enough, but there are pathways to pursue to get there. And then I think it's really about building up, you know, some some credibility or some uh, clarity around: Are you resonating using TikTok, using uh, YouTube or Instagram or others, and then using that to as your access point versus kind of going in with a piece of paper? Um, I think people will see that rightly or wrongly as, a, "Hey, you've got all these tools to define a style, to speak to that authentic voice, however it be defined." Um, so I, I think that would be my kind of best hack together answer for that. But more, more broadly on funding series, it's really hard. Like you know, working with the CBC uh, a lot right now, working with a lot of other Canadian broadcast partners, and, and we ended up growing. I'm I'm living in the U.S., been here about you know, seven eight years now, mostly while traveling a lot. And it's uh, you know because our our niche audiences of all of Canada, never mind the sub niches that we've been talking about. Uh, all of the the broadcast partners are being challenged by these global platforms that can buy rights and push budgets up, and never mind the impact of COVID. And so, and I wouldn't want to give the the, the impression that while well, money is out there, it's it's hard to access. Um, and so, maybe just a final thought would be again back to the theme that I had before, which is like find great IP or come with an audience or come with a clear perspective and find your starting point and make something and kind of build from that and get started on something, uh, which is self evident. Um, and, and then you might, you might find a path. It's incredible how many interesting series or how many interesting people, influencers, creators have come from just putting something up. And, um, and so I think money can seem like a panacea, a fix all for everything, but it, it, it's, it's not always the case. You need support, but you also kind of need to get going on things and, um, and then you can grow from there if that's helpful. That's really sound advice. Dave, Lena, or Rignum? I, I would just add to that. I think it's, it's that's a great sort of um, piece of feedback broadly. I mean, there are certainly um, sources if you research, um, like, I, for example, the Inspirit Foundation, they often have um, media grants for emerging um, uh, filmmakers and that sort of thing. So there are sources out there. But I do think an opportunity that didn't exist a number of years ago was really looking at um, how can you tell a story inexpensively um, with, let's say, a, a platform like TikTok, and then leverage that to um, to the next level in terms of can you um, parlay that experience, that short film, into a longer story um, of you know seven, twelve minutes, for example. So I think that to think of it not as an end but as a progression. Um, and as a journey, so you're not just trying to make, um, you know, there's, there's, there's degrees to what you can accomplish and create um, just by using, you know, freely available resources. And then when you want to tell a, a larger story, you can do that as well. Um, so I would think just to, to think about those like low hanging fruit tools that you can use to, to tell a story cheaply to, to sort of create a signature. Great. I think that's a really strong note to end on. Thank you so much, Dave, Lena, Michelle, and Rignum for your time. I think, I think this was an incredibly valuable session for our audience. I hope you guys enjoyed everything. Thanks so much.